Hello. Um, I want to continue with the third objective of the progressive movement. Uh, and this was the anti-monopoly objective of the progressive movement. As I indicated, essentially it would be on the national level that the attempt to both control and in Wilson's administration to dismantle large corporations would take place. It would not really be on the local or state level. And certainly, we were looking at Theodore Roosevelt. And let me, you know, just reiterate how if there was anyone that personified the new century, it was Theodore Roosevelt. The new century was personified by energy, by optimism. And that's one point I perhaps I did not make when I talked about the progressive profile, those that led the progressive movement. Even though we, we argue that perhaps this one scholar uh, whose theory that they were a displaced social elite, there was some validity to that. Unlike the populist movement we mentioned, the progressives, though, were very optimistic. It was during also a period of increasing prosperity. So they looked to the future. They had confidence and faith they could shape the future in spite of the problems that had come about as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And again, I think Roosevelt personifies this. He is comfortable with the pace of change that begins to quicken in the 20th century. He is not uncomfortable with the increasingly difficult and complex technology in the 20th century. He likes gadgets. He likes those kind, he understands those kinds of things. He is a man that is unafraid of making change. And perhaps it was that quality, his lack of fear, that was so troubling to many members in his own Republican Party. It was that fear that here was a man who was willing to make change, to go against the status quo, to go against perhaps those things that were sacred to a conservative, business-oriented Republican Party. That troubled party leaders like Mark Hanna. So much so that it he made that comment when McKinley died and Roosevelt became president that that damn cowboy was now in the White House. And indeed, I think for good reason, they were afraid of Roosevelt. No matter what he said to Nelson Aldrich about he would not rock the boat as long as they did not oppose his legislation. He would not tinker with the monetary system or he would not try to in any way change the tariff system. It didn't take long for the old guard or the business interests we talked about to realize that Roosevelt was not someone that they could count on to be in their camp to support big business unequivocally. He would support big business, but it would be a big business climate that was regulated. Well, we saw that immediately in that it didn't take Roosevelt long to become engaged in the fight to control large corporations. And he thought that large corporations, great amalgams of wealth, were becoming increasingly difficult to control. In 1903, we talked about the, the Elkins Act. 
which prohibited uh, rebates by the railroads. And then we would, I think we left off looking at the Bureau of Corporations Act, which actually was passed in 1902 but went into effect in 1903. This was the first real test. Not many of the Republicans really opposed the Elkins Act because they pretty much assumed they were going to flout it anyway. There was really not much that the government could do to enforce prohibiting rebates anyway. And indeed, by 1908, it was clear that the Elkins Act was an empty and hollow act that uh, railroads continued to give rebates. So they didn't really oppose that much. But when the Bureau of Corporations Act was proposed, John D. Rockefeller made it very clear to his friends that he did not want to see the Bureau of Corporations uh, uh, Act passed. He wanted it stopped. And he sent Roosevelt a message to let Roosevelt know that he was not at all happy about the bill and he didn't want the bill passed, period. Roosevelt wanted the bill passed and he made it very clear that if Rockefeller wanted to fight over the bill, he was willing to fight him for it. And indeed, Roosevelt was not opposed to going public. As Rockefeller began to uh, have his friends indicate more and more they were not going to get the bill out of the house, Roosevelt went public and says, I don't understand why John D. Rockefeller is opposed to a bill that would only strengthen the Interstate Commerce Act, which did not have any police power. That all the act would do would be to simply expedite the investigations into antitrust abuses. That the bill would, one, it would allow the ICC to subpoena the records. What good is an investigation? How effective can it be if you can't get a look at the books of corporations that you are prosecuting? The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 really had been a hollow prize. The Interstate Commerce Commission really did not have any police power to investigate, to, uh, uh, to subpoena books. But even more, not just the books and the records, because they could, they could get access to some, but they couldn't even make businessmen appear and testify before the Interstate Commerce Commission. They laughed at it. Yeah, well, well we, we may come you know, on my lunch hour if I have the time. But now, under the Bureau of, of Corporations Act, they could compel, they could, they could subpoena corporate officials and make them testify before the ICC. That, that was not a prospect that Rockefeller liked. And this was the first bill that he really had to fight for. And indeed, in the end, Roosevelt will prevail. And you will have the Bureau of Corporations uh, passed. But Roosevelt did not stop with the Bureau of Corporations bill. So now you have the Elkins, you have the Bureau of Corporations bill. Roosevelt now, th through his, uh, uh, in a sense, he was different as a president. If Roosevelt would have individuals in the House initiate bills on his behalf. As we will see, a part of his philosophy of being a, a modern president is that the president had the right and indeed the obligation to initiate legislation on behalf of the American people. That was a role that most previous presidents would not even entertain, that he had that role. And we'll discuss that even further when we look at 
1912 election today. But that was Roosevelt. He was a catalyst. He believed in having legislation introduced on his behalf in the House. The Expedition Act of 1903 is another example again of how effective Roosevelt was as a president. And always keep in mind that the Expedition Act or any of the acts that Roosevelt was able to support and get passed was at a time when he was not the elected president. Therefore, he was not the leader of his party. And that's important because it meant that he did not command control of the party machinery. And yet he was effective. Again, a tribute to a singular personality, I, call, I think, Roosevelt. The Expedition Act, proposed and passed, it did two things that were, again, designed to make it easier for the Interstate Commerce Commission to prosecute, or the government itself to prosecute, under the Sherman Antitrust Act. One, it would appoint an assistant attorney general whose sole function, whose sole responsibility would be to try antitrust cases. The appointment of an assistant attorney general whose sole duty, whose sole function would be to prosecute companies under the Sherman Antitrust Act. This would avoid having attorney generals tied up in other cases. This would be his full-time job and to expedite his job, to make it easier for this new assistant attorney general under the Expedition Act, it would allow the Interstate Commerce Commission to change the order of the docket in which antitrust cases would be heard. Now, why is that important? Well, the climate at the time, here we go back to the, we talked about the two things that the progressives had to do to make progressivism work. And that was you had to change the intellectual mindset of the American people, one, and you had to get them angry. You had to emotionally get people aroused. And when they were aroused, when they were angry, the government had its greatest chance of prosecuting antitrust cases. What businesses would do who were being investigated under the Antitrust Act, they would work to have their cases placed on the back of the dockets. Sometimes they wouldn't be heard for two or three years. By that time, who could remember? Who could remember what the case was about? Let's get the case heard while what people were upset to put pressure on the corporations and on and give the ICC an, an extra ability to be successful. And indeed, once again, Roosevelt is successful. The Expedition Act is passed, and now he has another tool. Three acts already. The Elkins Act, 
the Bureau of Corporations, and now the Expedition Act, which means the, the expedite. Okay, the expedite. But Roosevelt was certainly not through doing his first administration. Roosevelt, like most progressives, and this and in in this instance he was very much like most progressives. Most progressives had a belief in the need for a conservation program in America. The progressive, then and here again we go back to Roosevelt. Roosevelt was an outdoorsman. Loved and revered the outdoors. I told you he was sort of a, a, a grown-up kid. I mean, here you have the assistant secretary of the Navy during the Spanish-American War who would resign just so he could become a lieutenant colonel and lead troops up, up uh, in, in the cavalry up to San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. That's the kind of person Roosevelt was. Loved the outdoors. Believed, however, that big business was destroying millions of acres of America's natural resources. That unlike what many had argued that America's resources, while America was certainly one of the most blessed countries in the world in terms of an abundance of natural resources. Again, I argue that much of the success of American history is rooted in the bounty, the abundance of America's natural resources. It was John Adams in the 1700s who said that never in the history of man had God so blessed the people with such natural resources that America had the opportunity to become anything that it wanted. But clearly by 1900, there was some concern that this notion that America's resources were unlimited was incorrect. And that if Americans did not begin to preserve their natural resources, they would not have a future. And so the progressives, again, against business interests, because, I mean, why would they be in conflict here? Well, business interests did not want to have conditions placed on how they developed land. It wasn't just the preservation of land that the progressives were after in Roosevelt. It was the efficient use of land that so much of the land had been simply wasted in the pursuit of industrial growth. That, business, that businessmen and corporations would have to now find ways to be efficient as they used America's resources. So Roosevelt would do two things during his administration actually doing both terms to achieve a conservation program. The first real conservation program in American history at this point. One, he would in fact have the Newlands Reclamation Act passed. The Newlands Reclamation Act. 
this would allow the president to take a portion to take a portion of the receipts from the sale of public lands and use that money toward certain reclamation projects. Let me, repeat, let, me, let me repeat that again. That under the Newlands Reclamation Act, the president would have the right to take a portion of the receipts from the sale of public lands and use that money for certain reclamation projects. For instance, in 16 states, most of them western states, using these receipts, using this money, they were able to build dams, thereby preserving not only the water supply, but also the land itself. But he wasn't simply satisfied with the Reclamation Act. That was not enough for Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the first president to challenge and in fact oppose the renewal of a lease of public land to a private corporation. In 1903, the renewal for the use of a place called Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Muscle Shoals project, Roosevelt opposed it and in fact blocked the renewal of this lease to make a statement about how this company had used and wasted the land through inefficiency. Yes. Can you repeat that again? Okay, sure, absolutely. That Roosevelt was the first president to oppose the renewal of a lease of a lease of public land to a private developer. And in this case, it was a place called Muscle Shoals, S H O A L S, Alabama, in 1903. He was the first president to have the the courage to say, "Look, this company has wasted, has been inefficient." And we're not going to do that anymore. Companies have to be land responsible. Of course, they didn't, the, the companies didn't like Roosevelt for this, particularly Western. The Western states really had a problem with Roosevelt because, as I started to mention a moment ago, he not only used the Newlands Reclamation Act to preserve America's natural resources, but he used a the executive proclamation, his power as a president, to take more than 150 million acres of public land out of use to private corporations and placed it under the National Reserve to protect it. 150 million acres of public land. Cold, phosphate. He placed certain streams and waterways under the protection of the government. Roosevelt was clearly an avid conservationist. By 1907, the Congress, 
which represented the business interests, were absolutely livid with Roosevelt toward the end of his second term. I mean, he, could, he did this over both terms, from 1901 to 1907. I mean, and in 1907, Congress had been trying to find a way, the conservative Republicans who represented business, had been trying to find a way to clip Roosevelt's wings. And they thought they had him. Let me point, let me discuss it just for a moment. Oh, not the white one. Let me discuss this for a moment. The so-called Agricultural Act of 1907. The so-called Agricultural Act of 1907. And here again, this not only does this show that big business and the conservative wing of the Republican Party were upset with Roosevelt, but it also shows you just how how clever, shall we say, Roosevelt was in defeating his opponents. Well, with the Agricultural Act of 1907, it was a bill that Roosevelt believed in and supported, and in fact had the bill sponsored for him. The bill would give relief to farmers. But Congress said, well, the president really loves this bill. He wants it passed badly. Let's see how bad he wants it passed. So they said, okay, if he wants the 1907 agricultural bill passed, we'll give it to him, but we'll give it to him with a writer attached to it. This writer that was attached to the 1907 agricultural bill in his second term said that the President of the United States could not take any more public land out of use without the consent of Congress. Okay, they have him, right? They've got him there, you know, the Congress is grinning. They finally found a way to get the president, even if it is, you know, as we will see it on its way out. But they, they have him. That the president, if he wants this bill, and he wants it bad because he's, he's made public statements to the effect, he wants the agricultural bill passed. He will have to do it with this rider attached that the president could not take any more land out of public use without the consent of Congress. Well, Roosevelt said, mm, they have me, not. What he will do is that he will first by executive proclamation, take out of circulation most of the land that is left and place it under the Federal Reserve. And then he will sign the agricultural bill. <laughs> so the bill will have no effect. He's taking most of the land, rest of the land out. I mean, that's the way Roosevelt thought he was. And they, and, and, and Congress was just absolutely, they, were, they went into spasms. I mean, they were foaming at the mouth. Well, one other not an act, actually, one other, I guess, example of Roosevelt's effectiveness in terms of of challenging big business. Now, I use the word challenging as opposed to defeating and controlling big business. Roosevelt challenged big business, but in the end, as he would admit to himself, he had not tamed big business by 1907. 
We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But he will present a challenge to them, an effective challenge, one that he gets credit for. And to some extent, it's really not uh, quite true that he should get all the credit for, this, uh, for what happens, is that in 1904, the Supreme Court, I mean, I mean the ICC, using the Interstate Commerce Act, the Sherman Antitrust Act, will be successful in having the largest holding company in America broken up. The Northern Securities Company. It was a huge holding company that clearly under the Sherman Antitrust Act was in restraint of trade. It had limited competition and all sorts of things. But the truth is that there were even many big businesses who wanted to see the Northern Securities Company broken up. So it wasn't just something Roosevelt did, but because he had been campaigning for the control of big business, when the Northern Securities Company is finally broken up in 1904, it is Roosevelt who gets the credit. We always talk about presidents who, gets, who, who get credit for things they don't necessarily do themselves simply because they're presidents. Well, he gets credit for this, and in fact, when this company is broken up, Roosevelt is then dubbed, is then held as a trust buster. Okay? As a trust buster. Roosevelt was not a trust buster. And in fact, there were other cases that never that were never prosecuted because Roosevelt came to terms with the businesses. If they were reasonable, if they were into negotiations with the ICC to modify their actions, Roosevelt had no desire to, per to pursue prosecution against these companies. And there were a number of companies that Roosevelt could have prosecuted and didn't. His goal was simply not busting up trust uh, of corporations, but the regulation. But the title stuck. And it could become useful, too. And it did become useful in 1904 during the presidential election, but he wasn't really a trust buster. So Roosevelt's first administration... was certainly successful. But Roosevelt always in the back of his mind as he challenged, oh, I should, I should point out too, uh, uh, that in the, I don't want to miss this one, but in the uh, Newland Reclamation Act, I like to bring out Roosevelt's political and skillful infighting. And, and certainly with this one. When the Newlands Reclamation Bill was proposed, the Speaker of the House, Joseph Cannon, who we talked about, who represented Western business interests, had publicly announced that the bill would never get out of the hopper in the House of Representatives. So you can just take that back and tell the president the bill will never make it. Well, at the time that the bill was, was in the House, another bill came up. The so-called Rivers and Harbors Act. This bill would have benefited no one more 
than the state of Illinois. And guess who represented Illinois? Joe Cannon. So, Roosevelt sends Joe Cannon, Uncle Joe, he sends him a nice little note. Joseph, correct me, I mean, jog my memory. Isn't there a bill that's, that will build my desk soon? The Rivers and Harbors bill that, correct me, I mean, but won't that benefit your state more than any other state? Wouldn't it be a shame if for some reason I had to veto that bill? I know you'll give due consideration to my Newlands Reclamation Act, won't you? The bill the next day went out of the hopper and it flew through the house. <laughs> that, that was Roosevelt. That was vintage Roosevelt. The same way in the Agricultural Bill of 1907, too. I mean, he's, he, was, he was just that good. And he was always aware, too, that he was fighting the most powerful elements within his party, that he was going against the tide. He was aware that he had not been elected. So between 1901 and 1904, Roosevelt will not simply challenge big business, but he will also be trying to build a base within the Republican Party that will be loyal to him in 1904 when they have the Republican Convention. He has to find a way to change the base of the Republican Party so that they will vote for him, so they will nominate him for president in 1904. And certainly there were people like Mark Hanna, business interests who said who made it clear that when 1904 comes Roosevelt will never get the Republican nomination forget it so Roosevelt began to try to and so he be, he did this in several ways one and the most important was that he began to reappoint and appoint people who were loyal to whom to him federal patronage he used even in the South, Roosevelt began to appoint Southerners to positions if they would be loyal to him during the Republican uh, Convention. These were so-called uh, it was a, actually, it becomes known, it, it, this is interesting, because it created some controversy in the South. There were still some leftover Republicans from the Reconstruction era. Not many, but still some. And there were some gold Democrats. That is, the Democrats who didn't support the silver standard. Uh, and they were conservative. So they could, so they could constitute a, 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 a black and tan party, it was called by 1904 in the South. But what was interesting, though, is that Roosevelt did not know the South as well. And he wanted someone in the South who he could call on, who would know which individuals within these two groups that he could appoint to positions who would be loyal to him during the caucuses in 1904. And he chose, of all people, a man by the name of Booker Telefero Washington, a black president of a school called Tuskegee Institute. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about Booker T. Washington later, but for the moment, suffice it to say that Booker T. had been tapped as the black leader for, black, for African Americans by the white business structure 
in America. That Booker T. Washington was a creation, in fact, of the white power structure in the South. But he knew everyone by 1904 in the South. He was respected by Southern whites because of his philosophy of accommodation, of acceptance of segregation, uh, social seg uh, uh, segregation. But he knew Southerners, he knew Andrew Carnegie, he knew the Rockefellers, he knew everyone. So in 1901, this early, Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House for dinner. Strictly business. But for dinner. Now when for dinner and, and to discuss this idea of political patronage. But when word got out, first in the New York Times and other newspapers, that Booker T. Washington had had dinner with the president, many Southerners were absolutely livid. Southern white women flooded the White House with telegrams telling the president, Mr. President, I can't even talk. Mr. President, after inviting that colored man to the White House, no self-respecting Southern white woman could ever accept an invitation to eat at the White House again. Booker T was in jeopardy of losing his position as leader in the South. Southern white businessmen and those who supported him said, Booker, 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 what do we have here? One minute you're telling us you believe in being as separate as the five fingers on the hand. That was his speech, in the Atlanta Exposition speech. And now we find that you're having dinner with the president. Well, we can't even have dinner with the president. It became what Roosevelt was absolutely astounded with the furor over what was to him a simple dinner. And eventually it died down through some very fast talking on the part of both Washington and Roosevelt. But, and they were able to create the so-called uh, black and tan party, uh, and these people would certainly have been loyal to him in the 1904 conventions. But the truth is he went through all that trouble for nothing. When 1904 comes around and there's the presidential election, Roosevelt is so concerned about not winning that he makes some statements that he regrets for the rest of his life. The most important is that he says that if he is elected president, he will not run for a third term. There's nothing constitutionally to limit him from running for a third term, but he makes this statement on the eve of the convention that he will not, if he becomes president and elected, he will not run for a third term. Words that Roosevelt wished in 1908 that he could take back, but he doesn't. And it's all for nothing. He was, he was so concerned about the nomination. When the convention convenes, Mark Hanna does Roosevelt the ultimate favor. He was so nice that he died on the eve of the convention. And Roosevelt walks in and gets the nomination now with no opposition from Mark Hanna and his people. <laughs>
And then Roosevelt makes another comment. He says, well, and when I'm elected and I come back into the presidency in my own right, then watch out for me. Well, the president is elected. Now, there's some, we can't say that he was technically re-elected president. Because the first time, well, he was not elected president in 1900. He was elected vice president. So in truth, this is the first time that he is what? Elected president. So when people, you know, there's this debate about whether Kennedy and uh, uh, Teddy was, was, was the youngest. It depends. I mean, if you, if, you, if you include his first administration when he comes into office, he is the youngest. But he is not elected pre president until 1904. He is elected vice president and he assumes the presidency as a result of the assassination of McKinley. But he has aged some years. He was just about ready to turn 43, but now it's 1908. But he wins the election, and he gives a stirring inaugural address. Almost two-thirds of the inaugural address deals with social welfare what he is going to do. He is going to use the nation's capital as a model to show the country how they ought to go about passing legislation to help those who could not help themselves. Workmen's compensation. Access to medical care. All kinds of things were in his inaugural address. And yet, Almost his entire second term was consumed not with social justice legislation, but once again with fighting big business. And in that second term, it is a frustrating term for Roosevelt. In some ways, it is not nearly as successful as his first term. There are several uh, successes that Roosevelt will have during his, his second term. Some are carries over from things he began during his first term in office. One will be the Hepburn Act of 1906. The Hepburn Act of 1906. When Roosevelt returns to the White House, there are some scholars who argue that he is depressed. He is literally depressed about what he calls the enormous power of big business. By the time he begins his second term, most of the acts that he had had passed during this, his first term were basically, had been ineffective. Corporations, he began to tell his friends, seemed to be, they were so big, they were, they had become so powerful, they had no sovereign who could exercise power over them. He began to campaign against certain practices of corporations, particularly, for instance, even political campaigns. He was one of the first presidents to actually campaign for campaign reform. For instance, he will lash out. <laughs> 
at the practices of railroads who will give free and unlimited travel, first class travel, or first class Pullman berths, to politicians. Well, obviously, that's an enormous contribution. If a congressman who supports the railroads of big business, if they can travel on the trains for free anywhere they want to go in first class service, that amounts to a considerable amount of money. He wanted to limit the amount of money that people could actually contribute to political campaigns. This was Roosevelt. This is not 19, this is not the year 2000. This is 1906. He wants to limit the number, the amount of money that people could contribute to political campaigns. And eventually you do have the stopping of the practice of trains giving these free trips. I mean, it would be, what could we compare it with? Would we be outraged, for instance, if, if Continental Airlines were to give certain politicians free and unlimited Air my, uh, airfare trips. Surely we would be upset about it. It would be some influence, would accept some influence over uh, a, a politician, and we would uh, certainly oppose it. Well, Roosevelt, in fact, did the same thing with the railroads, which was the, the at this point, premium form of transportation. But still, that wasn't enough. He, he attacked. Campaign finance. He opposed the perks that were given politicians to buy their service. But still, he wanted to find an effective way to control big business. And in 1906, he has a bill introduced which becomes known as the Hepburn Bill. This bill, if passed, would be an effective, the first time, an effective federal enforcement of, or an, an, an effective federal regulation of the railroads. The Hepburn bill would do the following. On the complaint of a shipper, a farmer, or anyone who shipped goods on the railroads. On the complaint of a shipper, the ICC would have the power, the police power, to review existing railroad rates. So what I'm saying here is that if a shipper said that they were being charged too much, that they were the victims of what? Of rate discrimination. They could file a complaint with the ICC. The ICC could then review those rates. And if in fact the ICC determined that these rates constituted rate discrimination or that they were too high, the ICC could then set aside those rates. And set new ones. Ones that were fair. Tremendous proposal, tremendous bill. The only recourse that business would have would be the ICC's decision would be subject to judicial review by the courts. But the fact that it could set aside rates and set new ones would indeed be a landmark act. And believe me, everyone knew it, both the progressives on the one hand and the big business on the other. This was to be a fight.
Big business pulled all of its support to oppose the Hepburn Bill. Even Roosevelt became somewhat depressed for a while as the act seemed to be stalled in committees. In fact, people didn't hear much from Roosevelt for a few months. This was, a, this was unlike the president. The Republicans in, who were big business uh, advocates even made disparaging comments about Roosevelt. They said, well, the Russians who had just had the 1905 uh, uh, the first step of that revolution, uh, one of the Republicans said, well, you know, if, if the Russians want to know where they could throw a bomb, we can suggest a place and they would point to the White House. They didn't like Roosevelt. I mean, at this point, this was bitter. And then Roosevelt decided to come out fighting. He began to shadow box with the Republican business leaders. He now proposed to do several things, or at least to take a look at them, things that he had promised Nelson Aldridge that he what? He would not do. And essentially, I don't think he was going to do it. I think it was a bluff, but it was a bluff that they were, here's a man you didn't bluff. Now, you, know, you, you, didn't, you didn't call Roosevelt on any bluffs. We'll look at in a moment the, the United Mine Workers strike of 1902 that I wanted to talk about separately uh, as a, a retrospective to how this man did unprecedented things during his first two terms. But you didn't call Roosevelt's bluff. And Roosevelt began to make speeches. He said, you know, maybe the time has come that we ought to review tariff rates. Maybe, just, just maybe the tariffs are too high. And keep in mind, business always wants what? Hot protective tariffs. And just maybe since we're at it, why don't we, maybe we should take a look at the banking system, the monetary system too. Maybe power is concentrated in the hands of the National Bank. Maybe we should think about tinkering with that too as well. Oh, heck. Big business, they were aghast. He was a Republican violating or suggested he might violate their two sacred commandments. Almost overnight. Because he had, by 1906, Roosevelt had a reputation of following through on what he said. They dropped opposition to the Hepburn Bill, and it passed. And it passed. Remarkable. In terms of political politics, it was remarkable. It, it was a landmark act. It was the first time in American history that an act gave the federal government power to regulate a big business, effective power. But we don't end there. Just for good measure, Roosevelt will also have the Pure Food and Drug Act uh, act passed in 1906. Here again is another act that no other president could have gotten passed except Theodore Roosevelt. It wasn't the first time you read the jungle. The proposal of a pure food and drug act was not the first time that such an act had been proposed <laughs> in Congress. But every time a proposal to regulate 
the purity of food. It met defeat in the Senate. The Senate was a graveyard for such bills. You could get it passed in the House because the House changed. You, and you could get some radicals in the House who might support a Pure Food and Drug Act. But when you went to the conservative Senate of men who were basically wealthy and men who had terms of six years, they didn't have to yield to what? The public temper. So whenever a bill passed, the House got to the Senate, it became a graveyard. Well, that was before Roosevelt became president. Antidotal rumor has it that Roosevelt, as I indicated, was reading the jungle. And got so upset that he said, I, I am going to pass something that will regulate the food and drug industry. And he does. The bill goes through the House, it passes, and it goes to the Senate, and there it is stalled. But Roosevelt would now employ a different tactic. He will, in the Department of Agriculture, there was a unit called the Poison Squad. The Poison Squad had developed a report that had been around called the Neil Reynolds Report. Sounds like the news, doesn't it? <laughs> the Neil Reynolds Report. It was a graphic, just as graphic as a jungle, report of how meat was adulterated, how people were sold rancid, spoiled, rotten meat with maggots, kickbacks. It was a really gross report. So Roosevelt decided that if the Senate wanted to hold up his bill, he would begin to release excerpts from the Neil Reynolds report. The longer they refused to pass this bill, the worst segments of the report he would release. He used the public outcry. And he threatened to release some, some really bad excerpts from the report. He said, oh, it gets better than this. And once again, what happens? The Senate folds, folds the pressure, and Roosevelt gets the Pure Food and Drug Act passed. And one other, since we're on the subject of an effective president, because in a minute we're going to go to somebody who was not an effective president. We'll spend about 15, 20 minutes on him. I still like him, though. But not like Theodore. I want to talk about this, the strike of 1902 in terms of Roosevelt's overall ability. I mean, we talked about how skillful he was. Well, in 1902, in early 1902, the United Mine Workers, working in the anthracite coal mines in Ohio and Pennsylvania, in small parts of Virginia, decided they had had enough they had been asking for wage increases, better working conditions, and some reasonable work hours. But the mining operators and the owners of the mines were probably one of the most difficult owners to deal with. It so happens, too, that 80% of the mines were owned by the railroads. The railroads owned a lot of different things, too, as well, besides just the railroads. Well, we've talked about how in the past most unions really did not fare well. 
But in 1902, the United Mine Workers had a very capable leader in the person of John Mitchell. John Mitchell knew how to exploit the press. He knew how to get the press to support the United Mine Workers. Oh, not at first. At first, when the strike began in March, I mean, I'm sorry, in, 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 in May, And they begin well, some shootings, some killings, and uh, he went public. And he talked about all they wanted was a fair shake. All they wanted was a way to make a living for their children, a decent living. The business owners refused to even discuss, to even mention them. Unions, they considered illegal. There was no place in America, in, in the free enterprise system for unions. How could they dare even talk about negotiating with them? As one business person put it, the mining operation was not a religion. It was not a an academic discussion or sentimentality. It was a business, and it was their business. Well, Roosevelt watched this, and as it got colder, the strike went into November. Well, what happens now in October and November of 1902? The strike is fully underway by October, November. People need coal. People began to do what? Suffer. Not just the miners, but the American people because coal was not being what? Extracted from the mines. Suddenly now, public opinion begins to wonder about these owners and these operators. Roosevelt is watching this whole thing, and he's disgusted with the mine operators. Op operators. These people, on the end of thoughts, he made a comment to one person. You can't reason with them. Soon Roosevelt said that he felt he had to do something. So he proposed a commission that he would invite the owners of the mines and the union with John Mitchell to come in just to the White House and just sit down and talk. He, 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 he said, I fully understand. I have no authority to do this. But for the sake of the country, I'll try it. Well, John Mitchell almost the same moment said, we agree, we'll be happy to show up in, at the White House and, 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 and discuss this. The mine operator said, the president must be crazy. He wants us to meet with a group of bandits and negotiate with outlaws. They had no, they were not going to meet with anybody. And Roosevelt became furious at their recalcitrance. Roosevelt eventually got sick of it and he called in his cabinet. He said, what I'm going to tell you today, I'm, 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 I'm telling you now, so you can sign off. I won't be upset. Because what I'm going to do is unprecedented. I've decided that as it gets colder and colder, the American people will face some severe hardships. So I am going to send in, if we cannot reach an agreement, if we cannot have a commission to talk about this problem, then I am going to send in federal troops 
to dispossess the mine owners and have the government run the mines. <gasps> Big business said, oh, wait, wait, that's impossible. He would never do that. He has no constitutional authority to do that. Nowhere in the Constitution does it give the president the right in a labor dispute to dispossess a private property and put in federal troops. Now, he could do that only under, I mean, even sending in troops, he could do it only under two circumstances. One, he could send in federal troops to make sure that a duly authorized federal function was being carried out. For instance, the mail service. At this time, was under the direct, under the government. Now, he could send in troops to make sure that the mail got through if there was a postal strike. And the only other way that you could send federal troops into a state anyway was if the governor requested. This didn't meet any of those. But Roosevelt made it clear. J. Piermont Morgan was being consulted. He was really the spokesman for big business. They said, Morgan, he won't do that. Hey, he's, he certainly won't do that, will he? J.P. said, well, it's hard to say about Roosevelt. I mean, who knows what he may do or may not do. He says, maybe, given public opinion has turned against us too as well, maybe we should go ahead and have this commission. And Roosevelt makes a concession. But uh, while they will not officially sit down with the, U uh, with the United Mine Workers as a union, they will sit down with someone called an eminent sociologist. Well, guess who the eminent sociologist was? John Mitchell. <laughs> but this is, this is a way that, you know, the mine operators would not have to say they were dealing with the union. Well, what happens is out of it, out of this meeting, this commission, you have the resolution of the strike by early 1903. It is the first time, again, in American history that a president has intervened into labor management relations and was able to negotiate an agreement between labor and management. When it was over and people began to get cold, the newspapers declared that what Roosevelt, no, what, what, Roosevelt, what Roosevelt had said is that he didn't do much. He said that all I wanted to do was to give everyone a square deal. That's all I wanted to do. But it was unprecedented, as was the president himself. It was the first time that a president had negotiated. Oh, well, first, it was the first time that a president had threatened, and I think he would have done it. Roosevelt once told William Howard Taft, don't ever pull a gun on a man unless you intend to use it. So I think he would have done it. So he is the first president to threaten to dispossess a private concern and have it run by federal troops. And secondly, the first president to negotiate a settlement between labor and management. And keep in mind, that was the third of the Ten Commandments of big business. Thou shalt not interfere with labor uh, and management relations, and he did that too during his administrations. Now it's 1907. It's a re-election. He's already given his word he won't run. He hates the fact that he's done it. But he's a man of honor. 
He's a patrician. He will not run for a third term. But we'll see who he chooses to run in his place. Thank you.